Good evening and welcome to First Baptist Church. We are gathered here this evening to celebrate with the Summy family the life and legacy of Pastor Daryl Christopher Summy. Daryl has meant so much to so many of us, and tonight we has been designated by the family and this church as a time to celebrate that. Daryl was a loving husband, father, and pastor. Now, I have not known Daryl as long as many of you have, but in the two years that I've had the privilege of knowing him, I have found three things to be true about him. First, Daryl was passionate. He was passionate about his wife, his family, the youth ministry, this church, missions, and most of all, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, and I can't forget that he was excited about anything North Carolina State. One thing I believe that Daryl would want you to know is that God is passionate about you and loves you to the very core of your being. Second, Daryl was relentless. He was relentless in his pursuit of God, his desire to reach students and the nations with the gospel, his desire to care for the needs of others, many times putting those needs above his own. He was passionate about, uh, relentless about his passion for this church and it being the best that it could be for God. He wanted everyone to feel loved and accepted. When my family and I moved here two years ago, he was one of the first to show up at our house and say, welcome to Eastman. Is there anything that we can do for you and your family? And he was relentless about packing everything possible and imaginable into any trip he planned. If you understand what I'm talking about, nod your head. I learned that firsthand when I went with the youth on a ski trip to West Virginia in 2020 pre-COVID. You have to be in good shape to survive any Daryl Summy planned trip. But he was also relentless in his pranks, of which many of you were probably either a participant in or blessed to be one of its recipients. I'm sure we'll have some stories about that tonight. Finally, Daryl was a fighter. He fought spiritual battles through prayer and the Word of God. And he fought for the hearts and souls of men, women, boys, and girls, to bring them to Jesus and to help them grow in their walks with him. I believe it was this fighting spirit that helped him through his last days. This fighting spirit reminds me of the passage of Scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. It says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have loved and longed for his appearing. Daryl fought that good fight. He has finished his course. He completed what God called him to do, and he kept the faith. And now he is with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, praising and worshiping his name forever and ever. So let's rejoice. And let's celebrate all that God has done in and through the life of Pastor Daryl Summy. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are and for your goodness. We thank you for Pastor Daryl and the Summy family. What a blessing they are. They're a true blessing to our church. Father, we thank you for each and every memory of Daryl that reminds us of your love and your faithfulness. Father, thank you for his sweet wife, Leanne. Father, thank you for how she has stood beside him and supported him through the years of ministry, Father, especially here at this church. We pray right now, Father, that you comfort her, the kids, and the entire family. Please guide them through these difficult days and this time that is ahead. Father, I truly believe that there's one thing that Daryl would want above anything else regarding this time of celebration, and that is for someone, or several, to give their heart and life to you, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray tonight that that might happen. Father, thank you for Jesus who gave his life on the cross and he rose from the grave for our salvation. We love you, and we pray this in the holy, mighty, and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. In the fall of 2005, I began to have some 
serious discussions with the music ministry uh, search committee at First Baptist Eastman, and when the discussions turned pretty serious, I knew that I needed to do my homework uh, in researching what kind of church uh, that I would possibly be going to serve, and so I called a lot of people, and I uh, called former staff members, I called uh, people that had been connected with this church, and then I called Daryl Summy, and I started my uh, friendship with him on the phone. And we didn't talk that long that particular time, I believe. Uh, he was in the middle of trying to go somewhere, do something as usual. But uh, we wanted to know if this would be the right place for us to come. And uh, specifically, I was concerned about what type of youth ministry that my children would grow up uh, to be a part of, because at the time, our oldest was in let's see, third grade, I guess. Uh, that's a long time ago now. But um, as uh, I talked to Daryl, I, I just sensed that God would be in it for us to come, and obviously it worked out. And uh, when I got to First Baptist East, but in November of 2005, I realized that Daryl and I had a lot in common, believe it or not. Uh, considering he was a youth guy and I was a music guy, typically those types are like oil and water in many ways, but uh, he and I found that we had a lot of things in common. For example, some of you will remember that for a long time, Daryl drove, an, I think it was a 1994 red Dodge Dakota pickup truck. And the vehicle that I was driving when I was called to this church was a 1994 red Dodge Dakota pickup truck. And we dubbed ourselves the Dakota Brothers. Um, and I learned uh, as soon as I met Daryl that we were both fans of, of teams from the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, Daryl was a diehard NC State fan, and I was a, unfortunately, a Georgia Tech fan, as many would say. And as a result of being fans of these two teams, we both shared our, uh, our share of disappointments because of our teams. And we had said a few times that um, when our homecoming would, get, would, would be here, that we hoped that athletes from our teams would be our pallbearers so they could let us down one more time. <laughs> I don't know if you have that arranged, but it would be fitting. We, um, I learned that we both loved music, of course, me being a, a minister of music, but I I realized quickly that I, I was no match for Daryl's ability to suddenly burst into virtually any song known to man that would match any phrase that was spoken. It was just really unbelievable how fast Daryl could turn to any song that was somewhere in his mind. Another way that I realized we were similar was that we both grew up as the older brother to one younger brother. We were both uh, had a family of two boys growing up. We were both the oldest brothers. And there really are a lot of qualities that go with being the oldest child. And Daryl and I shared a lot of those qualities, especially we knew how much fun it was to terrorize a younger brother. Right, Chip? We knew all about that. And since Daryl was two years older than me, I affectionately called him the older brother I'm thankful I never had. We both had a similar sense of humor in that we were both able to laugh at ourselves and laugh at each other without taking offense. And the old saying is, you know, if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? Well, in our case, if you can't laugh at yourself, you could always laugh at Clay and Daryl. But I realized as I've gotten older that having a healthy amount of self-depreciating humor reveals what psychologists say is a high level of emotional intelligence. Now, I'm not saying we had a high level of emotional intelligence, but if we did, it would make up for what we did not have by way of intellectual intelligence. And so we had to have something. And so because of our ability to have fun with each other and pick at each other, I really believe that was one of the keys to the success that we had as a team, as a staff, and why our church uh, staff has been so tight throughout the years. You know, we, we've taken the gospel seriously. We've taken the work of this church seriously, but we haven't taken ourselves seriously. 
And I really believe that's, a, that's an important distinction that if we can get right in many of our churches, in many of our homes, uh, I think that, that God would do great things through us. And I've had a lot of people say through the years that they've really enjoyed... I put Kleenex up here because of this. They've really enjoyed watching us pick on each other, especially at Facebook. And they said that they're going to miss it. And all I got to say is I'm going to miss it too. You see, you see, God designed us to be in fellowship with other people. And each person that we're in fellowship with brings out something in us that nobody else brings out. And part of what makes grief so hard is not only are we grieving the loss of that person, but we grieve the loss of who we are when we're with that person. And that person is never going to be there again, not in the same way. And so what I've done tonight is I, I want to take the next few moments and I want to show you a few mementos that I have of when Daryl used his vast creative spiel, uh, skills to have fun at my expense. <laughs> now, <clears throat> some of you who've been around this church for a long time know that about the year 2008, we had a guest preacher one Sunday night who um, Brother Jerry invited to come and preach. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this preacher... I was here one Sunday night, and, and we had a good crowd that night, and the congregational singing was, was better than normal. I mean, it was, it was a good night of congregational singing. And when, when our guest pastor got up that night, he said some words about being glad to be here that night, and he turned to me and he said, Clay, I just got to say that I really like the way you lead music. You lead music like a man. And I've seen a lot of music guys that don't do that. I just appreciate you being a man. And I thought to myself, oh no, <laughs> this, this is going to last a while. And throughout his sermon, he would, he would talk about me being the man. And I will say, there are a lot worse things that a music guy can be called <laughs> than the man. And so at the next fall festival, again, at the instruction of our pastor Jerry, <laughs> Jerry said to Daryl, it would be a lot of fun if we had a man booth. <laughs> and and Daryl said, don't worry about it. I got it. And so at that fall festival, uh, you know, I'm, I'm expecting a great fun-filled time, and I start seeing people looking at me and laughing and saying, you got to come over here and see this. And there was this booth of pictures of me, and I just can't describe all the things that had been put in that booth. The other night, uh, Todd, who was not here at the time, I showed Todd a lot of that stuff, and he laughed more than I've seen Todd laugh in a long time. But one of the things that he did was he would take my picture of my face and put it in, you know, different situations as he could do on uh, Photoshop. And he put my face on top of a body of a mixed martial arts fighter, which is the opposite of the body that I carry around with me all the time. And so um, a few years later, when I had my, um, I had a 10-year anniversary at the church, and the choir had a had a fellowship for me, and probably again at the instance of the pastor, they decided to roast me. Do you remember this? So what they had was they had Daryl put together the man fan. <laughs> and there's that picture of my head on the mixed martial artist's body. This is limited edition, by the way. <laughs> Daryl's nickname for me was Clado. Call me clay -Doh. Now, you may think it's because I, I'm starting to look more and more like the Pillsbury Doughboy every year, but it really came from the, the, the uh, substance known as Play-Doh. And so naturally, for my 10-year anniversary, Daryl made a T-shirt for the event, and he put my face <laughs> on the Play-Doh logo. But the thing that um, I'm going to treasure the most, and, and I'm being serious about this, although it is a little funny at times, but 
Uh, Daryl knew that I had a unfortunate instance one time leading worship with the unauthorized use of a tambourine. And I won't go into any more details about that. And so what Daryl did to, to end that night and his big gift to me was, of course, Daryl gave me a tambourine. And you may say, well, that's, you know, that's really nice, you know. But what, what's, so import, what's so meaningful to me is Daryl inscribed, uh, he, he signed this tambourine. I guarantee you, of all the mementos you have of Daryl, nobody else has a signed tambourine. <laughs> That you're going to take with you, but I want to read the. Uh, talk on it. I want to read what he said if I can. He said, uh, "Happy tenth anniversary to my brother Clado. I love you and praise the Lord for you and your ministry." And then you know what he said: "Keep pressing on, Daryl." And then, of course, he had to put a scripture, and the scripture he put was Psalm 150, verse four. Praise him with the tambourine. <laughs> you know, um, I've, had a, I've had a hard time with this, and uh, I'm not ashamed to admit it. But grief over the loss of something or someone that we love implicitly declares God's goodness through what or who was given to us. You see, grief should cause us to look upward to the one who gave us that gift in the first place. And then it should cause us to look at the resurrected Christ. Because we are united to him and because Jesus Christ has overcome death, he's overcome death and loss, then we can say triumphantly that death and loss will not have the final word. And Jesus Christ gives us the power to overcome our loss today. And he will keep giving that power in the days to come. In just a few minutes, I'm going to do my best to try to lead us in a couple of songs. And we're going to sing the song. We're going to sing the song, Goodness of God. And I suggested that song to Leanne because the last time I was with Daryl was in this sanctuary on May the 23rd. And we didn't know if Daryl was even going to be here that day. Uh, he hadn't been able to be at church in, in a while. But Daryl literally willed himself to be here that day. And when I saw him, I knew that he was hurting. I knew it was a tough day. But he loved those students, and he wanted to be there for these students. And one of the songs that I chose to sing that day was The Goodness of God. And Daryl was sitting right here on this front pew. And I'm never going to forget this. He said he was sitting there singing as loudly as his diseased body would allow him to sing. And when we got to these, the chorus, the chorus says, All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Someone whose body is racked with cancer singing that. And I look out in the congregation at perfectly healthy people not, not moving a muscle. And I say, what's wrong with you people? If Daryl could sing like that of the goodness of God in the midst of the last days of his cancer struggle, folks, we ought to praise the Lord every day with reckless abandon. And so as we, as we sing that in just a minute, I want to encourage you to let's sing it in a way that is mindful of of God's goodness in that he allowed us to be connected to and impacted by Daryl sometimes in, in our past. And let's remember then that God's goodness will be displayed in the future as one day he will bring physical life back to Daryl's body and he will give it to all those who have trusted in Christ 
and we will sing, sing as the redeemed people of God around the throne, and we will sing, Behold our God forever and ever. Let's all stand together and we'll, we'll sing. Sorry, it takes me just a minute to get settled here.
just had to go and sing that before I came up to speak. Uh, that song means so much to our church, and it seems like we've sung it at very pivotal moments in our history. It was a song that Clay waited to sing until we came back together for the first time after COVID, and now we appropriately sing it for the memorial of our dear brother Daryl. I want to thank all of you for coming here today on behalf of the family as we celebrate the life and the memory of a dear, faithful, godly brother who has run his earthly race, he's fought his earthly fight, and he has entered into his heavenly reward. And I, I know that I speak on behalf of the family when I say that your presence here today is an immense comfort to them in the midst of their grief. To Leanne, and to Karis, and to Kaylin, and to Kinsley, Kristen, Agre, Babby and Dembe, to Mr. Darrell, Delbert, Carol, Shirley, the rest of this extended and close-knit family. I know that the loss that you are experiencing far surpasses the loss that we feel, and our hearts go out to you and our prayers are with you and we join with you in your grief. I consider it one of the greatest privileges in all my years of ministry to have been called to this church and to serve with this team and especially to serve alongside Daryl for the last three and a half years. Today is a hard day. This is a day that we prayed would never come, but God in his wise providence has brought us to this day and today's a hard day not because we don't know what to say. Today is hard because there is so much to say. Uh, there are so many memories and it's extremely difficult to know what to leave out. Now, if I were Daryl, I would not leave anything out and we would be here till 9.30 tonight. <laughs> My brother was nothing if not thorough. I knew of Daryl long before I ever met Daryl. While at seminary, I had the privilege of knowing so many students that had come out from under his ministry, and I had the privilege of pastoring several of them while I was at seminary. And Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits, and I can tell you the fruit of Daryl's ministry was impressive indeed. I saw the quality of the young men and women that had come out from under his ministry. Some people talk about coaching trees in sports. This coach had that assistant and that assistant went on to coach here and you know you just branch out from there. Daryl didn't have a coaching tree. Daryl had a ministry tree. And what a testimony to his life's work that there are so many ministers, so many missionaries that he helped shape and even if you're not a minister or a missionary, Daryl walked alongside you and helped you to know the Lord Jesus Christ better. At a time like this, oftentimes I try to find a word that I think encapsulates a person's life. For Daryl, that word was easy. That word is faithful. Faithful is not a flowery word. Faithful is not a fancy word. But faithful is a good word. The word faithful describes something or someone that you can depend on. And when you think of being somebody who was dependable, that was, that was Daryl. Daryl was a man that you could depend on. You could depend on Daryl to go above and beyond in everything he did. Long, lengthy discussions in staff meetings because a margin was not just right in the bulletin. And I joke about that, but as I walk around this facility, and I've walked around it many, many times today, every hall I turn down, Daryl's fingerprint is on there somewhere. The maps that you see guiding you around this campus, the signs that are there, the bulletins that we pick up on Sunday morning, the website, you name it, all of it has Daryl's fingerprints on it. Not only could you depend on Daryl to go above and beyond in everything that he did, you could depend on Daryl to exceed expectations in anything that he was involved in. You could depend on Daryl to plan any event that he was involved in 
right down to the very smallest degree. Now, that does not mean that it went the way that he planned it, but I can guarantee you that he had planned it. And around here, there was one other thing that we could always depend on. We could depend on Daryl to be late to anything that we had <laughs> planned. I've been asked to share scripture here today, and I consider it a great privilege to do so. And from the moment that I would knew that I would be standing here, the Lord laid Revelation chapter 14 on my heart. I'd like to read to you verses 12 through 13. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. The very thing which brings us here today and causes us grief, God says, is blessed. Psalm 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Today we mourn the loss of a beloved husband, father, son, brother, friend, to those of us on this stage, a fellow laborer in the field. But God says that he views his passing as precious in his sight and that his deeds follow him. His deeds follow him. That is an amazing picture to me. Everything that Daryl did for the glory of God and his kingdom, and that work is substantial, has now followed him on to glory as he rests from his labors. Yes, Daryl was a faithful brother, and I want to share with you briefly tonight a few ways that I believe Daryl displayed that faithfulness. First and foremost, Daryl was faithful to love his God supremely. To love his God supremely. Now, Daryl would be uncomfortable with everything that we are doing up here tonight. He would not like for us to be making this about him. He would say that he was nothing special, and I actually would agree with that because the secret to Daryl's life was not that he was special, but that he served a special God. Daryl, like all of us, was an ordinary guy serving an extraordinary God. And I'll tell you what, if you want to know what the secret of Daryl's life was, if you want to know what made him tick, it was simply this, that he loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, and with all of his strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. And he would want you to know that what he had could be yours. You know, if you're here tonight and you admire Daryl's life, as you should, we are called to look and to model ourselves after those faithful saints that have gone before us. But if you want to know the secret of Daryl's life, you can have it yourself. You can have the same God that he served because of the same gospel that he believed in. And if you would just put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know what gave Daryl his strength. Daryl was a guy who loved God supremely. But not only was he faithful to love his God supremely, he was faithful to love his wife biblically. Ephesians chapter 5 lays a heavy responsibility on a Christian husband. We are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And Leanne, I'm going to quote you here because I have read this statement over and over again since you posted it. My first and foremost prayer in college was that the Lord would give me a strong spiritual leader for a husband. Gracious did he answer my prayer exceedingly. And this is the sentence. No one has invested in me and my walk with the Lord more than my husband. Men, let me lay a challenge to every Christian husband in this sanctuary here today that every one of our wives should be able to say the same thing about us. Brothers, if your wife is not able to say that she is more holy and walking closer with the Lord because she is married to you, then we have much work to do. I always say that discipleship begins in the home. And Daryl displayed that supremely. And for Christian husbands, it begins with our wives. And Daryl was a model of a man who was faithful to love his wife biblically. But also on top of that, he was faithful to lead his children well. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6 tells us that the words and the commandments which God have give, has given us are to be on our hearts. We are to teach them diligently to our children. We are to talk of them when we sit in the house, when we walk by the way, when we sit down and when we rise up, and they are to be written on the doorpost of our homes. Darrell was not just a pastor at this church. More importantly, he was a pastor to his family. Every man is the pastor of his own house. And I can say that, guys, your lives are evidence that your dad has taught you well. What an amazing legacy and example that you have. And I know that you will carry it on in your own families. Darrell was faithful to lead his family well. But I want to close it up with this. Darrell was faithful to live his life with purpose. Darrell was faithful to live his life with purpose. If you knew Darrell, Darrell was probably one of the most driven individuals I have ever met. Uh, he was not comfortable just sitting around unless it was watching an NC State game. That was probably about it. And maybe he was busy during that. I don't know. Uh, but Darrell was a guy who always had something going on. There was not much grass that grew underneath his feet. He was always busy. And for most of us here, we know what his motto was. It was to press on. Daryl took seriously that admonition in Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already attained to this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The American philosopher William James once said that the best use of life is to spend it doing something that will outlast it. I believe my brother spent his life doing something that would outlast him. Not many of us get to say that the city in which we live in has changed substantially because we were there. But I believe with all of my heart, Eastman, Georgia, and Dodge County is a better place because Darrell Summey invested his life here. And I feel sure that everyone here today would say thank you to all of you for sharing your dad and your husband and your son with us. I've heard many times over the last few days, Darrell left some large shoes to fill. Darrell left large shoes to fill. I don't like that phrase. Only Darrell could fill Darrell's shoes. Nobody's been called to fill Darrell's shoes. Darrell was called to fill Darrell's shoes. And you have been called to fill your own shoes. But we've got a good example of someone who filled those shoes well. And may we fill them as well as he did. Was Darrell faithful? Yes, he was faithful. And may we be found faithful with the one and only God-given life that he has gifted to us. I'm going to be echoing a lot that's already been said. Leanne, it's been my honor that you would allow me to share in this time. Um, and I'll be honest, as I was thinking through this and uh, even through lunch today, I just felt numb and didn't know exactly what to say. And then Miss Cindy, you shared a verse of scripture with me from Hebrews chapter 7, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. Todd spoke a lot about that just now. As I like to think, and I probably am not, but um, maybe the first branch of that tree that went to seminary and serving and, and following the footsteps of a lot that Daryl taught me. 
it's always a mistake in that people think I was in Daryl's youth group. Um, I was here a long time. He was here a long time. But he came just after I graduated. I graduated in May. He came in September. He got here. He kicked me out of the youth group because um, I didn't want to leave. And there was only one way to get back in. So I became his intern. And I was his intern the next five to seven years. And I learned so much. I got the front row ticket to watch. In my uh, estimation, is the best youth pastor I've ever known. I was asked not too long ago why I would say that. Daryl was adventurous and creative, approachable, welcoming, loving. But most importantly, he was word-driven. A very rare combination for student ministry that have all those things. But the one that stands out the most is the word-driven. He loved the word of God. He had no issue trying to speak that word to anyone who would listen and to those who didn't want to. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He loved teaching that word. He loved training young people and really anyone who would listen to that word. He had no problem rebuking and correcting people with that word. We had a student, uh, or a former student, just this past weekend that said it was, I won't get this wrong, but his critical encouragement. And I was the subject of that critical encouragement many times. I won't share how those, what times are, but he loved the word. Daryl had a bit of reputation if you've heard already and we'll hear, I'm sure, many more times. We went a little bit long. I'm sure there have been many parents sitting in this room that have tapped their watches waiting for Daryl to finish on Wednesday nights. Even to the point when I got here, Daryl said, Tony, we really get, get back on time. I'm like, brother, all right, as you teach, I will make sure we start on time and I'll give you plenty of time. And the first day we did that, I had him ready to go at 7, 5, uh, 7 10 to teach. He would 50 minutes get done by 8 o'clock. He got done at 8.20 that day. <laughs> Daryl loved the word. This past camp, I was asked by one of our students what I thought about our camp speaker. And I was honest, I wasn't really impressed. He had some good things to say. He was a good storyteller, but he wasn't word driven. The student said that he noticed the same thing and told me he had been spoiled by Daryl because Daryl preached the word and stayed to the word and our kids, our church family, anybody knew him would know that. His desire was to demonstrate the word and you could tell that more and more, I think as he struggled more with cancer and the disease and all the issues that were going on and the more I saw that, I was each week, every Wednesday, especially that last sermon series he did on the book of Daniel, Cultural Babylon. And each week, as he had more struggles, I would say, Daryl, I'm, I'm ready, let me teach for you. You need to rest, you can go home. He was in so much pain. And you know what he would do every time. No, I'm going, I'm going to do it. He would get up and he would teach. He would even tell the students sometimes, like I'm not having a good day. And he preached some of the most powerful sermons I have ever heard him preach. Because I think he was led by the Spirit. He was word driven. He taught us to be word driven. He led in that. It's that passage I read a while ago, remember, your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. Daryl has done that 
for us. But then it also says carefully observe the outcome of their lives. As this man has served, I've heard testimony after testimony of even in the last days of phone calls and text messages that he would send trying to encourage trips that we would go on that he was not able to, even though he was trying to the last moment, said, maybe I'll make this one, and was not able to come. He would have lists of text messages and things written down for me to know some of the things that he would have done. And then one of the greatest testimonies, and Todd has already mentioned this, but Quote from Leon, no one has invested more in me and my walk with the Lord more than my husband. That's an example for us to live after. What a testimony. Now we can't echo those same worlds because there was only one wife to Daryl. But I think very similarly though, there are a lot of things we can echo with that because he invested the word in us. And as the last thing, as even though we observe his life, we observe his love for the word, his love for his family, his love for his church, it says imitate their faith. And I would be remiss not to share a few following words as I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 starting in verse 15, which was one of Daryl's favorite verses, and ending with one of my favorite verses in verse 21. He died for all so that those who, shall live, uh, those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on, then, we do not know anything from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we know him, we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is a Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God has recon is, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him, he made the one who did not know sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you want to imitate the faith of one of our leaders? Then do not live for yourself. Live for Jesus, the one who died and was raised. We have to recognize who Jesus is, the word that became flesh, the risen Lord and Savior. And as we had the privilege for the last 23 years to see that lived out in a man who loved the word. As Paul said, be imitators of me because I'm an imitator of Christ. I think we saw a living example of that in Daryl. Embrace the ministry of reconciliation if you're a believer, lest Daryl embraced it even to the last moments of his life. As we are called to press on, we mourn, as, but don't mourn as those who have no hope. We have work to do. And we had an example of someone who worked until his last breath. And if you're an unbeliever, the only thing I can say is be reconciled to God. The one that God sent from heaven's throne to be sent for us. So we might be the righteousness of God through him. And what a great testimony, not only by the life that Daryl lived, but to accept Christ because of the testimony and things that he taught and preached and that he lived out in his life. There are many of us in this room who have heard 
the words of Daryl for many years and have not followed those. And I say the words of Daryl meaning the words of Christ that Daryl spoke. What better time than now to surrender our life to Christ? Be reconciled to God. Believers, press on. We have work left to do. Then I stay off, start off by saying amen to my brothers. Um, uh, before I, I've been praying a lot. It's like, Lord, give me 15 minutes without grief. <laughs> and just show me and give me some celebration. And uh, that has been my prayer. But before I begin, I want to say praise to our God for this day. For this day that we are gathered here. For this moment when we get to celebrate a devoted servant of Christ, our brother Daryl Summing. To Leanne and Karis and Kaylin and Kinsley and Kristen, Augre and Dembe and Babby, uh, we love you. And we share in your grief and pray that God will comfort you for the rest of the family. Yes, there's been many tears, and yet there has been many smiles. If you were here last night, the stories that you would hear recounted of what Daryl has done, there were many. A lot of laughter, a lot of tears, and as we remembered, those times with Daryl. And we will always cherish uh, these memories. For in God's sovereignty, before God, in his sovereignty, he will bring people into our lives for a purpose. When someone comes in our life, it is not by chance. And it's not just for any purpose. It's for his purpose. And today we praise the Lord and thank him for bringing Daryl into our lives. And so I ask myself this question. Why, God, did you bring Daryl Summy into my life? In your sovereignty, why did you bring him into my life? And you can ask yourself the same question. Why, God, in your sovereignty, did you bring Daryl Summy into my life? Rest assured, it was not by chance. And it was for our good and for his glory. And so I thought about his life, and I thought about all the things he did, and about the things that he's accomplished, and all the things he said, and, and, the, and the words that he spoke, why he did them, how he did them, why he worked so hard, how he enjoyed life. And I said, Lord, how can I find the words that would ever represent, could represent a life like Daryl's? And God brought these words to my mind, and they're simple words, but these three words were, come with me. Daryl's life was an invitation to come with me, join with me, partner with me in serving a great God and living this life for Christ. First and foremost, to anyone who was lost, he would say, come with me, I will share with you how to know my Savior. I will come, come with me and I will show you in God's word how to come to know the great God that I know and the great God that I love. That invitation was always in the forefront of his mind, looking for someone. Come with me. I'll show you. If you're lost, I will show you the way. Second, come with me and let's serve a mighty God. Come with me and let's serve a mighty God. Serve the mighty God that I know and let us serve him together. When I think of Daryl, he was always inviting, come alongside of me and serve with me. And let's serve our great God together. And let's come with me and enjoy this life. Man, if you spent time with Daryl, you enjoyed life. That was an adventurous, uh, he was a, just an adventurous, he's the most adventurous friend I've ever had. And it got me in trouble, and I will tell you one story about that. But he knew how to enjoy life, and he said, enjoy this life that God has given us, making the most of our days. Because our days are numbered, and life is but a vapor. And if anyone knew how to make the most of a day, a 24-hour period in a day, it was terrible as summing. And like my brothers have already said, you, if you ever went on a trip with him, 
you found out exactly what I'm talking about. In September of 1998, in God's sovereignty, he brought Daryl and Leanne from the great state of Texas to the greater state of Georgia. <laughs> Go dogs! And that was for you, Dembe. <laughs> it did not take long. It did not take long before Tammy and I became close friends. With Daryl and Leanne. And uh, we began to raise our families together. I think, Karis, you weren't here yet, but you were, you were here, but just not here in Eastman. <laughs> I think maybe six months long, I can't remember. But I saw, as we became friends with Daryl and Leanne, I saw in Daryl a godly man. I saw in Daryl a pastor, a friend, a brother, someone that I could trust. And follow alongside him because Daryl knew where he was going. <laughs> he was following Christ. And I told, I told Peyton Smith last night, I said, Brother, I hope that you find someone like Daryl when you start raising your family. And I pray that for all the youth, that they would find someone like Daryl and Lynn to raise a family with. I can tell you this I'm a better husband, I'm a better father. I'm a better man, a better believer, a better brother in Christ because of Daryl's impact on me. And I want to share a story with you because it illustrates Daryl's life in regards to this phrase, come with me. <laughs> I was so blessed to be able to go to uh, Turkey, to go to, when Daryl said, man, we're going to go to a Muslim nation and uh, we're going to share the gospel. I was like, Okay, Daryl. I'm used to following Daryl. I'm like, okay, Daryl, I'm with you. And so we go, and, uh, and, I, and I will say this. I didn't have this in my notes, but you know, he, when you read about in a country where there's 99.9% .9 people that are lost, you think, wow, that's terrible. That's, 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 that's bad, man. You, I mean, everybody's lost. But let me tell you, if Daryl said, come with me, and I'm going to show you. And then to walk the streets of a Muslim country and every eye that you look into is lost. Then the reality of 99.99% .99 being lost takes it to a new level. And Daryl showed me that. But one day we went to this island and on this island there were horses pulling carriages up these hills, mountains, I don't know, I can't even remember the name of the mountain. And there were horseshoes on the side that the horses, they would they would fasten tire treads to these horses' shoes to help these horses get up this mountain. And they were all on the side of the road, and I said, well, you know, being a veterinarian, I said, that's pretty neat. I picked one up, put it in my bag. And I said, I got me a souvenir. I've never seen that before. Fast forward, coming back into the United States, <laughs> you forget. When you come from another country, you have to answer questions like, have you been around livestock? Have you been around horses? Have you been, of course, I did pet a horse, but I was checking, no, 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 no. But lo and behold, I'm in line. A customs agent says, Mr. Ron, come with me. I said, Lord, they found the horseshoe. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me in this room, and, this, and there, were, there was 15 or 20 people in this room, and there were three agents, and they gave me a folder and said, give that to the woman. I gave it to the woman, and I said, I said, oh, Lord, I watched my team go off. I'm in JFK in New York City following Daryl, and now I'm lost for sure. And I said, I was like, Lord, you've got to get me out of this. <laughs> and so, and God is faithful, I'll tell you that. And so I was sitting there looking, and we had about a one-hour layover. We didn't have long. And I said, Lord, I said, you got to make this happen. I looked at my little folder, and my folder was like four or five of them back. I was like, Lord. And they were taking their sweet time. They weren't in a hurry, but I sure was. I walked up. I said, ma'am, I said, I don't have but about 45 minutes to catch a flight back to Atlanta. I said, is there any way, out of the goodness of your heart, could you move my folder up just a little bit? And so she looked at me, and she was typing. She said, I'll see what I can do. And then, <laughs> so I wasn't real confident in that question. Anyway, she starts asking me questions, and I'm like answering them. And then she looked at me, and she said, what do you do for a living? I said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, I, went, I started to tell her I was a dentist. <laughs> I said, I said ma'am, I said, I'm a veterinarian. I, I just knew I was going to be in a room getting fumigated or something. 
she smiled at me and Ty, and she said, you're good to go. <laughs> I walked out of that. I still didn't know. I was like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what terminal. I don't know where to go. And here comes Daryl Summy coming down to get me. I didn't kiss Daryl. I wish I would have. <laughs> but I did hug him. I said, thank you for coming back to get me. He said, come with me. I know the way. <laughs> so, hey, Daryl never served in the U.S. Army, but he was in God's Army. And he lived by the motto, no man left behind. And I was that man. Hallelujah. He came back and got me. I say that story to serve as an illustration of Daryl's heart, Daryl's, his desire, his commitment, and his passion to share, to share the gospel with the lost, to be a witness for Christ. Acts chapter 1, 7 and 8, and he said to them, Jesus is talking to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Daryl lived that out. Daryl's Jerusalem was right over there at the station. Wednesday after Wednesday, week after week, month after month, year after year, for 23 years, Daryl Summy faithfully proclaimed the gospel, encouraging youth, inviting youth who were lost. Come, let me share with you how to be saved and to know Jesus Christ, my Savior. Faithfully, faithfully. But you know what? He didn't stay there. He went out in the streets of Dodge County and all over. And in, in, in raising our kids together, we would dress them up on Halloween. Halloween was to be with the Summies. And we would go to the Summies on Evergreen Circle. And we would walk around Greenwood Heights. And we would go trick-or-treating. And the kids would come back and they're all hyped up on sugar. And they're all just running around and we're eating some of Daryl's sweet pumpkin pie. And Daryl starts, he starts going to the door. The kids come in the door and he's putting candy in there. But those kids, when they came to the door, they got more than candy. You know, they didn't get a trick, they got the truth. He would have gospel tracts in that candy. And I remember thinking, I would have never thought about putting a gospel tract in a plastic pumpkin on Halloween for some kid to come to the door. But Daryl did. And little things like that made an impact on me. He was always focused on the eternal. And those faith business, we would get together before we'd go out. He'd say, tell me, who do you know that needs to be saved? And he would say, you know where they live? Let's go. Now, he wasn't a laser-guided bomb, but we would finally get to where we needed to get in all these back roads of Dodge County. But we would go out and seek and to share with Christ, share Christ with them. He would go to the schools and, and speak at FCA meetings. And I can list so, so much more that he's done here. But then you talk about the Judea and Samaria. You know, from there, we'd go to Belleville, Illinois. We'd go to all the way. We'd hit Fort Worth, te Texas. And then we'd hang a sharp left and go all the way to Brownsville to the border. And then we'd come all the way back. And, and then we would drive back from Texas. And one day, Daryl, you like to killing me, man. <laughs> well, I followed him. I said, Daryl, I'm tired of looking at your rear end all the way from Texas. And I followed him all the way to Georgia in one day. That was a long trip. But, but, I, but I love Daryl. And I was going to follow Daryl and support Terra, as many of you have. And then you can talk about to the uttermost, to the streets of Istanbul, and going, and we developed a, a relationship with a young man on a skateboard. Daryl's a skateboarder, y'all know that. And we went to the skate park, struck up this relationship, conversation with this young man. Daryl kept up, even when we came back, he kept it up, kept talking. He goes back two years later. They're walking down the street with a translator. And that young man says, I want to be saved. Daryl and the translator and that young man took up. They just get off the side of the street. And that young man, that Muslim, prayed to see Christ. You, I look back at the man that run up to Daryl on the beach. They're on the beach. I don't know where they're at. I wasn't on this particular trip. Goes up on there and says, do you have Bibles? And Daryl says, Daryl's smart. Now, I'll give you more credit. He's, he's smart. He said, why do you ask? <laughs> I'd, I'd have said, no, man, I ain't got no Bible. I, said, I don't know who that guy is. Daryl just said, why do you ask? 
And then he said, do you have Bibles? And Daryl says, why do you ask? He said, man, I went into this shop over here, and they had a, they were talking about a Bible, and they had a Bible. And they said, where'd you get that Bible? They said, man, there's some Americans that had just come in here and gave us a Bible. And that man said, I, he ran up, he said, I have wanted a Bible for so long. I wasn't by chance. That was God's provision, God's providence, and he shared uh, with that man. I don't know that he prayed to receive Christ, but he heard the gospel, and that man had a copy of God's word, and he went back. I don't even think he was from Turkey. It might have been another Islamic country around. And then you go to Africa, a small dirt floor church in the middle of nowhere. And Daryl's preaching. I'm sitting there watching him preach a sermon on Mephibosheth. And three women are saved. And that, that'll impact you. Not only. So, so if you were lost, he would say, come with me and I will show you Christ. Not only did Daryl come back and get me from, from that customs area in that airport, he led me the way. He said, he said Daryl, I mean, Daryl said, come on, Jim, I know the way. He knew the right where to go. I said, okay, I'm with you, Daryl. I was right following him, right going through gates, and we were going here, there, and everywhere to get to where we needed to be. And, you know, you see Daryl's life was an invitation to come alongside him, to come alongside him, to come with him and to follow him. And together, hey, let's follow Christ together. Daryl's life was an invitation like that. The most important invitation, the one that Daryl treasured the most, was the invitation that he extended to you, Leanne, on y'all's wedding day on August the 1st of 1992. In essence, he said, Leanne, come with me, and let's build a life together. Come with me, and let's raise a family together. Come with me and let's serve Christ together. Come with me. Daryl was a faithful husband and father. Leanne, you've been such a faithful, loving, and supportive wife. And a very, 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 very understanding wife, <laughs> I might add. Daryl liked to work, and he worked hard, and he spent some late nights working. So, full of grace. And kids, you've been so faithful to your father. You were so blessed to, to have walked alongside him, to be led by him. He was so proud of you, and he loved you very much. At the station to our youth, Wednesday after Wednesday, month after month, year after year, Daryl's invitation was, come with me, and I'll show you through God's word how to live this thing we call the Christian life. You come with me, and I will show you how to live the Christian life. And I will model it. And I will say this. There are so many parents who will forever be eternally grateful for his investment in their children. For the parent who, for whatever reason, spiritually, was not there for their child. Daryl stood in the gap. For the parents who are doing their very best to raise their children to walk with Christ. He's like, He's coming right alongside. I'll help you raise your child to be like Christ. Faithfully teaching the word to our youth. Faith visits. He would say, come with me. He didn't just say, hey, go share your faith. Go share your faith. He said, come with me. Let's go find such and such, and let's go share the gospel. And I want you to share your faith and share your testimony. And you learn to lead someone to Christ. Disciples making disciples. He modeled that. Encounter weekend student life camps. He would invite the youth, lay aside this time. Come with me. Let's study God's word and let us show you what it means to live the Christian life. And what joy it brought him to see God make, what joy it brought to him to see God move in the hearts of youth during those times. And not only move during those times, but to see it carrying on and I guarantee you generations are impacted generation after generation after generation because of Daryl's investment in their lives. Daryl would say come with me and hike the Appalachian Trail 
Okay, Daryl, let's hike. We're in no shape at all. Let's go hike. Anyway, Daryl was always fit. I mean, I tell you, no matter uh, his age and all those gray hairs, don't let his gray hairs deceive you. That man was fit, and he could run. He could walk. So we would follow him up and down that trail, and there were a few tears on those trails, especially when we got into the Yellow Jackets. I think I mentioned at least Yellow Jackets one time. <laughs> the yellow Jackets would make us cry, kind of like you've already experienced. <laughs> But then we, at night we would study God's Word. We'd have so much fun, exhausted, yeah, but we'd study God's Word. And then, and then come with me. Let's go skiing. Okay, Daryl, let's go skiing. I tear your meniscus, tear your ACL, whatever. Hey, we're going to go follow you, Daryl, up and down the slopes. We know Daryl loves skiing. And, and so he would, he would say he would spend so much time teaching these young people how to ski. And, hey, he would say on Sunday morning, ski church at the top, everybody, go to the top. And meet up at the top, and then you, everybody, whether you could ski or not, you had to get down one way or the other. <laughs> so, but we would praise God on the top of those mountains, on the top of that mountain, and hear that pastor proclaim his word. But he's like, hey, let's go. And I'll say, we all have a ski story. And I, I will say this. You could ask anybody who's been on a ski trip, and I'm just going to share one real quick. I'm not much of a skier, and I never will be. And I was riding the ski lift with Daryl and Derek Hutchinson and Ryan Shirley. And they were about to go down a double black diamond. Now Daryl's snowboarder and the other two were skiers. I kind of eased to the edge. I looked down and mm, I stay on greens. And I watched Ryan go down. I was like, man, he's got it going on. I see Derek do the same thing. And here comes Daryl. Do you think he carves? No, he just points it downhill and just flies out. I said, Daryl Summy is crazy. <laughs> I never saw him much because he didn't hang out on the green slope or the bunny slope. But I saw him one time and he said, come on, let's do this blue. I said, okay, Daryl. <laughs> so we do the blue and then I didn't know that the blue split into a black. <laughs> There's a reason they call them black and blue. <laughs> That's why I stay on the green. You stay on the green, you live. Black and blue, you might not. And I'm get, we get at the point where I can take a right and go to the blue or do the black. And Daryl's down below me and he's looking up at me and he's like, come on. I was like, I can't go down there. <laughs> Daryl's like, come on, man. He, he's looking up. He's like, come on, Daryl. He said, he said, I've seen you ski, Jim. He said, you can do it. You can do it. I said, I don't know, Daryl, I'd really rather go this way. I don't want to go that way. He finally told me, I said, okay, Daryl. I didn't make it 15 feet, and that was a tremendous crash. Somebody took a, somebody took a picture, and I looked like a runover possum. <laughs> and I, I picked my skis up, and I said, I will never follow Daryl Summy on the ski slope again. I followed him a lot of places, but ski slope, no. <laughs> Daryl knew how to have fun to teach and learn about God. And he can blend it together like that. To our local church here, and Daryl loved the local church, and he would say, he would invite, there's many of us in this room, hey, come, teach a Sunday school class. Come teach a class. Come be a chaperone. Come disciple some youth through this book. Uh, come pour into our youth, constantly asking us to come alongside and serve with him. Come alongside, hey, let's partner with the ministry. Let's partner with Operation Christmas Child, one dear to his heart. Come on, church. Let's give. Let's do shoe boxes. Let's do spurring us on, asking us to join with him to support a great ministry like that. Pastor Wambua's ministry, the Karabangi program, the Mosja Ministries, getting the gospel out to the nation. Daryl was saying, come on, local church. Come with me. Let's serve Christ in this way. And missions, let us go together, fulfill the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go and make disciples, go to Africa, Central Asia, Texas, Florida. And I'll say this, in Belleville, Illinois, we had a great time, as we always do. A lot of work. And I sat there. We would work hard, and it was so much fun, but we would work hard, exhausted. And at the end of the night, at the end of the day, we'd meet up, and he would share with us. He would point out something, share a truth. He said, y'all circle up. So we got in our chairs in a circle. 
I was like, what is he fishing to do? And he sits there and he turns around. And he grabs, we're all seated. He takes a basin of water and a towel. And he washes our feet. He goes around to every one of us, washing our feet, telling us that Jesus Christ didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. And lastly, not only, I'm about to close. Lastly, I know I'm going nowhere and I should. This is for Daryl. Lastly. <laughs> I'm just going to play the Daryl card. You can play the Daryl card alone. And lastly, not only did Daryl come find me when I was lost, not only did he lead me through that airport in New York, he got me back home to Eastman. He got me back home to Eastman. And I've heard him tell the youth many times, life is but a vapor. Life is brief. Every day is precious. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. Make the most of your days, for a day is coming when this life is over. Daryl's run the race and he set, that God has set before him and he's finished the course and he's finished well. And I want to leave with you a challenge. And I want to read from Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is admir whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. One, as a believer, if God has used Daryl to encourage you, to challenge you, to teach you, to lead you, to show you the way to live a life for Christ, press on. If Daryl did those things and you were running well, but you've gotten off the path, it's easy to do leaving the youth group going to college. It's easy to do in adult life. It's easy to get off the path. If you were running well and you've gotten off the path, <laughs> Daryl would say, get back on the path and press on. And not just Daryl. He would say that because that's what God was saying. Get back on the path and press on. But to those who have been blessed to know Daryl, whom God used to share Christ with you and to teach and to show you God's plan for your life, and yet you choose not, consider the course of your life in the direction that you're going. Consider the words of Christ, repent and believe. And I am convinced that if Daryl could come back from heaven, he would proclaim Christ with the same conviction. He would proclaim Christ with the same passion as he did before he left this earth. There's not a shadow of a doubt. But there's one thing that he could say that he wouldn't have been able to say before he left this earth. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Come join me. See the Savior that I have seen. For my faith has become sight. And I have heard the words, Daryl Summy, well done, my good and faithful servant. Glory be to our great God. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Now, you didn't think that we had this uh, service for Daryl, that it would be short. You didn't think that, did you? <laughs> the family has asked me to share the gospel, and that's the very thing that really motivated Daryl. For 23 years, he served here as our youth pastor. And this church has had some really good youth pastors in the past. But uh, Daryl is the best I've ever seen. And you've heard all of that at this time. I just want you to know that... Uh, Everywhere I go, pastors ask pastors, they say, well, tell me about your minister music. And we have a really good one of those. Of course, uh, Clay hadn't been here quite as long as Daryl, but we've had a good staff. And I would say this about our youth pastor. I'd say, man, I've got the best youth pastor in the country. 
but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I was careful who I told that to, but he was a blessing to me as a pastor. He required very little supervision. He was always cooperative. He was eager. He was energetic. And he blazed a trail. But I want to tell you why he blazed a trail. It wasn't just because he was a summy, although I thank God for Daryl Summy and I thank God for his parents. These two parents have raised two godly men, I start to say young men, Chip, but y'all aren't as young as you were, who really love God and, and that, that comes from a, a Christian home where Jesus was first, where the word of God was read and, and prayer was conducted and from a, a good church in Panama City, Florida. And uh, I thank God for Daryl. I thank God for, for their family. And, and Mr. Delbert and Carol, y'all did a fantastic job. The psalmist says our children like taking an arrow, putting it in a bow, and shooting it out like a warrior. And Daryl has been a warrior for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I also want to say a word of thanks to you as a church, this church, for calling Daryl, for supporting him, because he really put us to work, didn't he? I mean, he was looking for something all the time that we needed to be doing for the Lord. And the Samaritan's Purse thing just exploded into a huge ministry which has blessed people all over the world. But I also want to say a word of thanks to Leanne because Daryl did work a lot, and her and Karen talked a lot. They discussed that, and Amy talked a lot. But uh, pastoring, we need to be passionate and energetic and focused and it's hard sometimes to balance your home but Leanne has been a blessing to this church and these children this whole family and in these last days these last few years that have been very difficult very hard uh, Leanne has just done a phenomenal job and not not just taking care of the family and taking care of Daryl but researching all kinds of stuff and looking for everything and we all have prayed have we not we all have fasted we've all prayed and asked God to heal and bless and God often answers our prayers but in this case he answered our prayers and I'm going to tell you how he did it in just a minute let me let me share this with you in Psalm 9 in verse 1 it says I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart and Daryl had that attitude of gratitude because he not only understood the gospel, he had experienced the gospel. He had experienced the new birth. He had been born again from above. He had been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Not everybody who says, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, has experienced that. He didn't just know about God, he knew God. And he wanted everybody else to know God. Jesus said in John 17, 3, he says, this is eternal life, to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And so I want to share with you what the gospel is really all about from one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And it, you, you, may, you who are members here already know this probably, but there's no better passage on this subject, the subject of the gospel and the subject of death and eternal life than John 11, where Jesus is saying, I am, saying he's God, I'm all God and all man in one person. He's claiming to be the same as Jehovah God. Yahweh in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3. He's already said, I am the bread of life. He's already said, I'm the light of the world. And in John 11, he says, he says this, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. And all who live and believe in me shall never die. And that's, a, that's the most powerful statement that's ever made, ever been made by a human being, I believe. And I want to tell you why. And I want to tell you the circumstances. In, in John chapter 11, Jesus had some friends in this little village, village just outside of Jerusalem. And it was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Lazarus was sick. And they sent for Jesus because they knew Jesus could heal Lazarus. They knew he could heal anybody. And Jesus, when he heard it, verse 4 says, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified by it. And then a little later after Lazarus dies, Jesus, he delays, Lazarus dies, Mary and Martha aren't really happy about it. And Martha says, when Jesus arrives, she says, Lord, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened. When he finds Mary, she says the same thing. 
she, they've been talking about this. Lord, if you'd have been here, this would not have happened. As though this is it, this is the end, and it's not. Jesus told his disciples in verse 15, he said, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him talking about going. And Jesus knew exactly what was about to take place. And he lets everybody know, including Mary and Martha, that he has power over death. And that's what the gospel is all about. You see, the, the reason we have problems, the reason we have brokenness, the reason we have pain and sorrow and death and trouble in this life, and it's real for all of us, and we have a death date on the calendar. Everybody in this room is going to die. Everybody. It's on the calendar. It's going to come. You don't know when it is. I don't know when it is, but it's coming. The Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after this comes the judgment. But see, sin has, has messed up our, our planet. We have, we have major issues because the wages of sin is death. But Jesus is the solution. He is the only one who really has the power over sin and over death. And so I want to share with you three truths out of this passage where Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And the first one is this. As God, and that's what he was claiming to be. Every time he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. He's claiming to be deity. He's claiming to be God. His enemies understood that. His disciples understood that. The Jewish leaders knew exactly what he was claiming to do. And he even said in John 8, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. See, I am is who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. That's that covenant name of God, that personal name of God, that sacred name of God. And this is the miracle. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is the miracle that, that Caiaphas and the, and the Sanhedrin began to say, this guy's got to go. We're going to lose our power and influence. He's got to go. He has to be killed. And that was God's plan. Not that they would sin, but it was God's plan to send his son. The Bible says God so loved this world, a world of people that don't love him. The love of he, the, the people who live in this world, God so loved this world that he gave and sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And here, here's the deal. You see, the way, the, I've been a pastor for 40 years, and I want to tell you something. There's a difference in the way a believer dies and an unbeliever dies. It's different. I've seen a lot of people die. I'm not just saying I've seen them in the funeral home. I've seen a lot of people die. I've been there when they died. There's a difference. Because God is not just with us as believers. He lives in us. And he says that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? We don't need to fear anything. In fact, this passage, this statement Jesus makes, reminds us that the believer really never dies. The body dies, but Darrell has not died. His body has died. And his, one day his body will be raised from the dead. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even, live even if he dies. See, there's physical death, there's spiritual death, and there's eternal death. And none of them are good. But physical death, everybody experiences. And spiritual death, we have as sinners. We are spiritually dead. And Jesus spiritually raises us from the dead through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is about God who made us, created us, and who upholds all things by his power, and he sent his son into the world, even though we have sinned against God, even though we deserve to be punished for our sin, God loves us and has demonstrated his love by sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to live a perfect life, to fulfill the law, to die on the cross, to be buried in the tomb as he, was, as he said he would be, and then to be raised from the dead. As God, Jesus is greater than any problem we have. Not just when there's a death, but any problem we have. I mean, we have a real asset with Jesus Christ, amen? I mean, we've got the Son of God for us. If he's for us, who can be against us? As Romans 8, 28 reminds us, it, it tells us that, that all things work together, not the good for everybody, but for those who who love God and are called according to his purpose.
Another thing about Jesus in this statement about the resurrection and the life is that as Savior, Jesus delivers us from death and gives us eternal life. Now, I, I think our church knows that, but we've got a lot of guests here today. I want to make it clear. You know, one day we'll physically die, but every person comes into this world needing spiritual life, life from, from above. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Something supernatural has to happen in your heart. You have to be spiritually raised from the dead. In this, in this statement, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And then he says, and everyone who lives, in that second statement, he's talking about spiritual resurrection. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Daryl, his body died, but Daryl's never been more alive than he is right now. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And one day his body will be raised from the dead and he will receive a glorified body just like our Lord and Savior. Jesus is God. Jesus is our Savior. And as, as the Messiah, he identifies with us. See, Jesus was the God-man. He is the God-man. All God, all man in one person. The, the word Messiah means anointed one. He is the one promised in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9, throughout the Old Testament, you have all these prophecies about the Messiah. And he is the anointed one who came into this world to save us from our sins. Monday morning, this weekend was hard for all of us. We had The Peel household had trouble sleeping Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. But, you know, God's at work and he's, he's helped us in these times of grief. And I, and I was in my regular routine of reading through the Gospels, and I was in Matthew 26. And God show, showed me something I've never thought about. And I want to share it with you, and I hope, it'll, I hope it will encourage you. Because in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is in the garden. He's praying. His disciples are sleeping. And you know what, you know what he prayed, don't you? He said, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup is the cup of judgment coming from the Old Testament. The cup of God's judgment upon sin. But Jesus has been telling his disciples for two years. He says, the Son of Man, he said, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be buried and go to the cross and be buried and be raised from the dead. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't like it, understandably so. But Jesus has been telling them, this is what's going to happen. And as I'm reading Monday morning, and I just see this verse I've read over and over and over before, and I thought, well, why was he struggling with this if he knew exactly what was happening? And I'll tell you why. Because he was the Messiah. He was all, he, all man and all God in one person. He knew what it was like to be tempted. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be tired. He knew what it was like to have pain and trouble in this world. And he was struggling with this so much, another gospel tells us that he sweat as, as it was drops of blood. He knew what was ahead, and he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Let's postpone this. Let's do this a different way. I'm not sure all that he meant in that, but that's, that's what Jesus said. And then he also said, but not my will, but thy will be done. That's what Christianity is all about. Not my will, but thy will be done. And in the next, he did this three times. And it shows that he identifies with us. And here's a prayer that he requested. And the answer was no. The answer we're staying with plan B. And plan B is you or sent into the world to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sin upon the cross. And see, probably you like me have been praying for years now and months now that God would totally and completely heal Daryl, right? We've been praying that God would intervene. But he is healed. He's never been more alive than he is right now. Here's, here's my experience in, in the time I've been a believer since 1972. 99 0.9% of the time, God answers my prayers differently than what I, what I want him to do. Does anybody else have that experience? 
Most of the time, it doesn't happen the way I want it to. And, and it's something we're taught to do is to come to God and say, God, we're not to go demanding God, now you have to do it this way. Some people teach that, and that's not true. Because that's not how Jesus prayed here. He said, but not my will, but thy will be done. And here's the deal. God's will is always better than my will. God's will is always better than your will. God's plan is better than our plan. And we need to assume that he knows more than we do because he does. And we need to always embrace his plan. In, this, in these months and weeks now leading up to Daryl's going home to be with the Lord, he's been concerned about the gospel. He's been concerned about his family. But he's, been, he's persevered. He's stuck with the faith. He's had an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. He went th through some really difficult, troubling, hard times. But what we see in, in John 11 is what Daryl believed and understood to be true, and that is that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he is the one when a person puts their trust in him and repentance goes along with faith, the one who repents of sin and puts their trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says they have eternal life. And once Jesus makes this statement, I'm the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He asks a question. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe he is the Son of God? Do you believe he is the Savior of the world? And to believe there doesn't just mean intellectual. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. It means to repent and change my mind, my way of thinking, and embrace him totally as my Lord, my Savior, my prophet, priest, and king. That's why the Bible says in John 1, that as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God. Daryl did more in 23 years than a lot of pastors do in 50 years or 70 years. And he was on it now. He was fervent. He was zealous. He was committed. He was devoted. He was organized except for his office. <laughs> we don't understand that. I mean, he was organized except for that one section of life. But he was, he was a hard worker. He was fearless. He was authentic. He was genuine. He was bold. He was loving. He was humble. And I want to tell you why. Because he knew Jesus Christ. He knew the Lord. He grew up in a Christian home that taught him about God and went to a church that taught him about God and the gospel. And he was saved and born again. And he was following Jesus as we've heard. And he loved God and he loved people and he loved the lost. And let me just ask you this tonight, the question that Jesus asked. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? There's not, there's not a more important decision you will make in life than what will you do with Jesus? What's your response to the Son of God? Are you going to postpone it or are you going to embrace it? There's nothing that would make Daryl happier and God happier right now, right here, than for people to receive Jesus Christ right now, to repent of their sin, Repent of their self-centeredness and living for me, myself, and I. And put my faith totally and completely. And as, as has already been said, and give your heart to God. Give your life to God. Give your life to Christ. Daryl loved God. Daryl had the Spirit of God. Daryl walked in the Spirit. He ran his race. And God sometimes take, takes people young. Jonathan Edwards, Edwards was probably the, one of the greatest theologians we've ever had in America God used him to bring about much of the great awakening in the 18th century. And yet, in his early 40s, he's called home. David Brainerd was a missionary to the Indians up north. Related to Jonathan Edwards, he goes home at 29. There are all kinds of people that die early. Stephen, in the book of Acts, who's stoned to death because he glorified God and preached a really good sermon. And they stoned him to death, probably as a very young man. But his testimony still lives. And the testimony of Daryl Summy is real. It was powerful. And family, we're so thankful 
that y'all landed in Eastman, Georgia, at this church. And I remember his first words. You probably don't, his first thing he said when he got out of the car, the truck, or whatever y'all came in. He stepped out and he looked around. It was it was September. He said, "Ah, humidity." <laughs> There's a lot of humidity in Panama City, where he grew up. And in Fort Worth, Texas, it's a lower humidity. And that's the first thing he said, ah, humidity. <laughs> but after that, he went to work. They lived in that, that past storm. And everybody who lived there, lived there had girls. <laughs> Every, everyone who lived in that house had girls. And uh, he hit the ground running. And he has been a blessing to this pastor and to this church. And I'm so thankful. I'm thankful to God for the Summy family, for his ministry here with us. And I think, I think it's already been said, that not only will this church, has this church been affected, this whole county has been affected and the whole world because of the, of the life of Daryl Summy, because he was all in. He was sold out. And that needs to be the case for every single one of us, not just pastors, not just missionaries not just deacons. Let's bow to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God, that we might be forgiven, that we might be adopted into your family, that we might be transformed by the power of the gospel and the power of the Spirit, that we might be born again. We thank you that Jesus took our guilt, that he drank the cup dry. He took the judgment. He died for our sins and for the sins of the world and was raised from the dead. And we thank you, Lord, that he lives forever. And I, I pray, God, that we would be zealous as Darrell was. I pray that we would be faithful. I pray that we would be workers. I pray that we would uh, be diligent in what we do, that we would live first and foremost not for ourselves but for the glory and for the kingdom of God and for the advancement of the gospel. Bless this precious family. Bless this precious church. Lord, we thank you for every person, every student, every child that's been affected and influenced through the ministry of Daryl Summy. And I pray, God, that, that we would follow Christ even as he has. I pray you'd walk with this family by your spirit and use your church and your, your body to love them and to support them. And we thank you, Father, for loving us. And we give you praise for your son, Jesus Christ, and for your servant, Daryl Summy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to attempt to do something Daryl never did, and that's stick to my time limit tonight. Um, there was a lot of times at the youth that uh, he had a, a lot of angry mobs outside waiting on their kids, and he did not care. So. <laughs> Um, as you can kind of tell, I'm a little bit younger than the rest of the guys that got up here. Uh, nothing on them. But um, I was part of Daryl's youth group. Um, I grew up kind of under him. Um, a lot of times looking to him for guidance and leadership, you know, rather than the Lord himself. And um, I modeled my life after him as he did Jesus Christ. And um, I don't think there's any better way somebody could live their life to lead other people than Daryl Summy did. Um, I'm not much of a public speaker. I was kind of nervous about this, but uh, one thing I always remember Daryl saying to me was, don't chicken out, and that caused me a lot of injuries and a lot of pain. Um, <laughs> but when I was looking at that picture sitting down, I just, it's not hard to talk about Daryl Summy. Um, the majority of my memories and uh, experiences and rather radical, dangerous experiences that I enjoy telling um, came from my times with Daryl. Um, you can take that as a good thing or a bad thing. It was a little bit of both. But um, it's kind of hard to follow after Jerry Peel and um, Clay and everybody else, but um, my, my purpose up here was to, yes, tell some experiences with Daryl, but um, mainly to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there's not one thing that Daryl would want more than somebody in here tonight to turn their life around for Jesus Christ. If not, every person that doesn't know Jesus Christ to turn their life around. I can promise you that, that 
that is what he wants out of this service. Um, like I said, I, I follow Daryl all through the youth group and all over the country and all over the, the world. And um, there was many times where he led the way. Actually, the majority of the time, he led the way. Um, anything we did, any, any dangerous things we did, um, he was the one leading the way. He was leading me, and I was always right there behind him, as was a lot of other youth members. Um, there was a few times where I decided to lead the way, and as I was sitting in that chair, I thought about him, and I was like, wow, that's, um, I can see why Daryl led. Um, one of the times, we were running up that, the Appalachian Trail, running uphill, um, full speed ahead. Daryl was leading most of the way, and Doc actually reminded me of this earlier. Um, and Daryl, I kind of got ahead of him and started running, and uh, we were jumping through some rocks, and, and I slammed on brakes. I noticed something under my feet, and it was a copperhead. Um, and if any of you don't know, that's a highly venomous snake. And um, Daryl ran up behind me. I had frozen my tracks. It was right between my feet. And uh, if any of you know Walker Stanley, um, he grabbed a stick and started poking it. <laughs> and uh, so that was one time I decided to lead the way instead of Daryl. Um, the other time, um, Daryl had warned all of us on a ski trip that, uh, you know, don't, don't go hit the ramps, don't go hit the rails, you know, that's dangerous. Unless you get kind of approval, you know, chill out, you know, don't do that. Well, me um, leading my own way, doing my own thing, I decided to uh, not listen to that. And um, I broke my collarbone on a rail. And somebody up above on the ski lift saw me, and they called Daryl, and Daryl met me at the medic tent. And um, ended up, Daryl had to drive me over two states to go to the hospital. And uh, they gowned me up, and he just took pictures of me the whole time and laughed at me. And um, so that was kind of a I told you so moment after having a couple hour car ride of him, you know, letting me know that. So, um, but anyways, like I said, I had some stuff written down just uh, to share the gospel more than anything. But I just, you know, as I was sitting, I had those stories um, that just kind of came to my mind and made me giggle. But um, I came across this passage today, um, and it's, everybody knows it. And if you haven't heard it, you're about to. But um, it's Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, when I think of Daryl, I'm reminded of this Bible verse. I'm reminded of the living testimony he was and will always be to our church and our community. If there is one wish Daryl were to leave behind for each and every person in this room, as I said before, it would be for you to fully surrender your life to Christ. He would want us to go and make disciples of our families, our friends, our communities, and obviously after the mission trips of our nations. Um, God has a calling for each of our lives, um, and that is to be a living sacrifice day in and day out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, if any of you today want to know God's will for your life, look at Daryl Summy. And look what he did in the example he set, because I can promise you, Daryl Summy accomplished the will of God for his life. Um, when I reflect on kind of the past couple days, as, as many of you as, uh, as well, it's been rough. Um, and I find myself questioning and, and, and worried and sad about this, but when I picture Daryl Summy in heaven, <laughs> singing his lungs out like he did on this stage helping with worship every now and then it's not sad at all there were many times I'd walk in the sanctuary and see Daryl was leading worship and I was like oh oh lord but <laughs> there was no other person I'd rather have up here leading and raising their hands and worshiping Jesus Christ it didn't matter if he was a little off-key every now and then. It did not matter. Daryl Summy was up here worshiping, and he did not care who was looking at him. I can guarantee it. I could stand up here for hours and tell stories, experiences, and injuries that happened with me and Daryl. 
but there's nothing more Daryl would want than the gospel of Jesus Christ to fill someone today. I challenge you, just like Daryl would, to reevaluate your lives and to lean on Jesus Christ and repent. Be the voice to those who have not heard. Be the hands and feet of Jesus and love your enemy. Be like Daryl and press on. was a Daryl's living hope, and as um, all these other men have said, I know that he would desire for um, that to be true in your life as well.
Amen and amen. Well, my, um, my purpose in being here is to give some closing remarks and prayer. I'd like to pray first, okay? Would you um, shift in your seats if you need to, get yourself a little more um, comfortable if your circulation's cut off in some places, shift a little bit. But uh, let's, in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to lead us, and when we lead in prayer, that means I want you all praying silently as I lead us aloud. Would you do that? Father in heaven, um, all praise to you. We're so thankful that you have allowed us this privilege, Lord, to celebrate the life of Daryl Summy. You, Father, have, have shown us an example. You have given us opportunity to laugh. You've given us opportunity to cry. You've given us opportunity to, um, uh, to show how you, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, can work through an individual in a tireless way to see that the gospel is spread from this place across the world. Uh, thank you, Father, for what you have done through Daryl Summy. Now, Father, um, our hearts are broken. We know Daryl is, is, is with you, Lord, and, and uh, we understand that your word says in Romans 8.18 that I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. We know that one heartbeat out of here, Father, Daryl did not remember the suffering anymore. But we, Lord, still are to linger here, to serve here, to press on here, as he would tell us. Father, this family is hurting now, so I ask you please to bless and comfort and strengthen with inner strength as well as physical strength. Leanne and Karis and Kaylin and Kinsley and Kristen and Agre and Babby and Dembe, Carol and Delbert, Shirley, Chip and Amanda, Kelly and Dan, Jason, and all the rest of the Summy family. We, Lord, pray that you would pour the balm of your Holy Spirit on this family and soothe the hurt that's there, Lord, because the tearing away hurts. We confess that, Lord, and we admit that. Also, Father, <clears throat> we know that we become a spiritual body when we are bound together by your Spirit through Jesus Christ. So this church, Father, is Daryl's family, is Leanne's family, is the Summies' family. family. So, Lord, we are hurting, too. But I thank you that you allow us the privilege that we've had uh, these past two days to, to meet together yesterday evening uh, to, to comfort the Summy family, uh, to, to soothe and comfort each other, to encourage each other, and to show the joy that comes to us because uh, your Holy Spirit is our bond. So now, Father, we ask you please to grant comfort to this family and comfort to this spiritual family and allow them to be able to press on into the future knowing that you, Lord, will see to their needs because you tell us that he who has begun a good work in us will continue to do it until the day of Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I'm, I'm not sure how to wrap my mind around all that's gone on the last couple of days, and especially this service this evening, but you've, you've heard the gospel presented to you. Uh, you've, you've heard how Daryl lived the gospel. Uh, you've heard um, from young people, and now I'm the oldest one of this bunch up here. Um, so, so you've heard from us all. Um, I would like to have taken you over to the station in your minds. The station it's called, because that's the youth building, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that. Because <clears throat> so named the station by Daryl himself, uh, because... It's, it has the theme of an old filling station where you go get gassed up and head out. And um, the idea 
is to get spiritually fueled and go uh, into the world and share the gospel. As you head out the door, there's a, there's a sign up over the door that says, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Um, that comes from um, a, a wealthy man named William Boredom. In 1904, he was the heir to the Borden Dairy Estate, graduated from a Chicago high school, a millionaire. His parents gave him a trip around the world, and traveling through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe gave Borden a burden for the world's hurting people. Riding home, he said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. When he made this decision, he wrote in the back of his Bible two words, no reserves. Turning down high-paying job offers after graduation from Yale University, he entered two more words in his Bible, no retreats. Completing the studies at Princeton Seminary, Borden <clears throat> sailed for China to work with Muslims, stopping first at Egypt for some preparation. While there, he was stricken with cerebral meningitis and died within a month. A waste, you say? No, not in God's plan. In his Bible, underneath the words, no reserves and no retreats, he had written the words, no regrets. In, in the year 2000, um, when, when the lot of the world, as we were approaching 2000, a lot of the world was worried about um, uh, everything shutting down with our computers and our clocks and everything because uh, some, some of you that are old as I am remember Y2K, okay? Some of you don't have a clue what that means. But it meant that when we hit the year 2000, our, 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 everything would think it went back to the year 1000 and everything would just wreak havoc. Well, we were in Atlanta at a youth retreat, uh, and when we came back, uh, Daryl coined that phrase, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets, and that's over the wall, uh, right over the doors as you come out of the youth building, and truly, that's how he lived his life. Um, one of Daryl's favorite um, uh, verses, and... Um, I started counting the favorite verses that uh, reminded me of, of Daryl, and I'm up to 147 and still counting. <laughs> but but um, one, this, this verse in uh, Colossians chapter 1, Christ in you, the hope of glory, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toll, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Well, that was Daryl. Uh, Delbert, you said to me that God gave him a good, strong body, and he used it up every bit. None was left. And um, Clay, that's what he did with his old red truck. I think when he finally, when, he, when that thing finally stopped, nobody wanted it, you know. Usually somebody wants your old used truck, but nobody wanted that one. But... But it, he used, used up everything that he had, um, used it completely up, um, when, um, and, and yet no, no reserves. He used every, every ounce of his being uh, to serve the Lord. Um, no retreats. When, as you all have said, and Jim, you said it so, so, so well, um, that he didn't back up from anything. Even when... Even when our Lord saw fit to afflict him with this, these tumors, um, I remember the day in the office when he told us that, um, that they were there, very casual, very matter-of-fact about it, wasn't, wasn't shaken, at least on the outside. And then he began to pursue everything he could to, um, to cure that, even though the doctor said there's, there's no cure for what you have. But he pursued every avenue that he could. Did you not, Leanne? Um, well, the, 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 the legacy that he has set as a youth minister, um, other youth pastors who want to do a good job um, pattern their youth ministries after Daryl's. Um, I ask a few of the students some, some things that they might want to say, and, I, and I, I won't tell you all those for the 
sake of time, but, um, but my son Andrew told me this. He says, when we were at camp or world changers or other mission trips, it always stood out to me how different our youth group was from many others. So many youth groups clearly had no serious ministry happening. The kids were just there for fun, and it showed. But through Daryl's intentional focus on the ministry of the Word and discipleship, ours was different. There was a spiritual mindset, a desire for the things of God rather than worldliness rampant in so many youth groups. That was God's grace to us through Daryl. He knew how to fun, have fun, yes, but he knew we were there for so much more than just fun. Now another one of those verses that reminds me of Daryl is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, uh, conviction is what Daryl had. Strong convictions for his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we know that chapter 11 of Hebrews is that faith heroes list of those that, are, that uh, accomplish great things for the Lord. Uh, well, none of us will have the privilege of being listed in that uh, hall of fame of faith that's listed there, all those heroes there, because heroes there, the Word of God's already written. But you know what we get to do is live it out. We get to see what's in that word there, and we get to live it out. Can you not imagine Daryl Summy running his race with countless numbers running behind him that have come through his youth group, and some of us old folks that hung around with him too, uh, running the race that's set before him uh, because that's what God called him to do. Now, at the end, at the end of... Chapter 11 comes chapter 12, of course. Um, the first few verses says, Therefore, seeing we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. As Daryl's tumors continued to rack his body, it became difficult for him uh, to get any kind of relief. The treatments, the medications, just didn't seem to relieve his intense pain. We prayed. We prayed hard for his healing, as, as my brothers have said. We prayed for relief from his pain. And our gracious Lord would give us some temporary relief at times or give him some. Uh, like when we fasted and prayed just recently and, uh, and um, God allowed the doctors to, to, to put Advil uh, intravenously into his body and gave him relief from the pain uh, and sleep for about eight hours. Um, we would pray, and we did, and we prayed fervently that God would completely heal him, and we'd give glory to God for a healed man. But God's plan was different. Um, <clears throat> uh, he had a different plan. And as he neared the end of his life, Leanne asked me to share this with you. As, as he neared the end of his life, he, as he was heading down that stretch toward home, toward the finish line, the pain was so intense that he could hardly bear it. Uh, he couldn't shift in his bed or chair or any way at all that he could get relief. But there came this song <clears throat> that, that God gave him. And as you shared with me, Leanne, he could get in position in that chair and, and hit the button to play that song and it would relieve his pain at least to the point where he could endure it. You're about to hear that song played on the, on the CD in just a moment, but because the words won't be on the screen, I want to share just a little bit of it with you. Shepherd of my soul, it's called. Lord of the mountains and seas, you are treading a path set for me. God of the seasons and sky, you have always been holding my life. And Lord, you are the shepherd of my soul. 
So I lay down my plans, I give up my rights, and let you take control of this surrendered life. So I put my trust in the one who created the stars and the sun. Oh, you are eternally kind, always faithful, and eternally wise. And Lord, you are the shepherd of my soul. You comfort, you sustain, in shaking, you remain unmoved and unafraid. Forever and always, you lead me beside still waters. Lead me through the valleys. Lead me in your wisdom. Through valleys and the shadow of death, I am not afraid. By my Father's breath, every star in the sky was made. And who can fear? Who can I fear when you're standing right here by my side, always leading and guarding my left and my right? Father, you make all things new great God of creation, and Father, you will always be my rock and my salvation. Listen closely to the words of this song.
I want to leave you tonight with the words of the, the final verse of the hymn, Soldiers of Christ in Truth Arrayed, which says, We meet to part and part to meet when earthly labors are complete, to join in yet more blessed employ in an eternal world of joy. To our brother Daryl, we have met, we have parted, and we will meet again in a world of glory. But until that time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God bless you all. Go under his mercy. You are dismissed. <laughs>